Shalom, shalom, my Havarin. Greetings, my YouTube Mishpaha. What's up, what's up, my people? And welcome, or welcome back, friends, to Bible on a Bicycle. Super Cut! My name is Will, and I'm an aspirant follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. You might know him as Jesus Christ. And a Supercuts fan edit is where we go out and tackle a particular subject or topic from within the pages of or surrounding our Bibles. And then first and foremost, whenever applicable, we open up our Bibles and take a look at the scripture for ourselves, reading it within context. And then I go out so you don't have to. And I gather up all the varying and oftentimes opposing viewpoints philosophies, teachings, and preachings from various theologians, philosophers, teachers, and preachers. I'm going to bring that all together and uh, chop, 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 chop that all up. And then through the mysterious technology of video editing, I bring that all back together and smush it all into something that's hopefully cohesive and comprehensible. And then I serve it right out to you in the form of a Supercut Spam. And in this here little particular video, we're gonna be going back to those days of Noah, taking a look at rebellious angels and half-breed giants from within the Bible. And in order to do that, we're gonna rely upon two gentlemen that are way better spoken than I, and that is first and foremost, the late great Dr. Michael S. Heiser, theologian, scholar, author, and a great man of God. And then on the other side of the room, we got Steve Quayle, author, a biblical speaker, and a man of God in his own right. So without any further ado, I'm just gonna turn it right over to these gentlemen as we delve into the subject of rebellious angels and half-breed giants from the pages of our Bible. Huh. even as everything is lining up. We are in the days of Noah. Uh, the, the Book of Enoch uh, it appears to have been written in the Second Temple period, but it's set in the you know, pre-flood, flood period. So you know, how do we talk about its date? I guess is a good way to summarize that. When, when you talk about a book, you, you have to clarify whether you're talking about manuscript data or whether you're talking about the ideas in a particular book. In terms of manuscript data, the oldest stuff we have for Enoch comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So people, you know, scholars who you know, are really focused on this area are pretty comfortable dating Enoch roughly second century BC, so 200 and more recent, 200 to one, you know, down to year zero, if you want to use that terminology. Um, and that's because there were Aramaic fragments of Enoch found at Qumran. So there is, there is no textual evidence older than that for the book. Um, the, there's a lot of Greek evidence that comes from the same period. Most of the book is preserved in Greek. The Aramaic is fragmentary. The only place the entire book is preserved is in Ethiopic, which is quite late for us. If you're talking manuscripts, you're talking the late Middle Ages uh, for the whole book, uh, getting up into the early modern period. But everybody, again, because you have the Qumran stuff, everybody figures, well, the, the book at one time it existed at least you know, in the second century BC and you know, ostensibly in Aramaic. Now, if you're talking about the content of the book, which we spent a lot of time here, really specific points of content in Enoch are much, much older than that. So there's a literary history, a manuscript history, and there's a conceptual thematic content history. So, you know, usually when people ask the question, they're talking about manuscripts, the actual document itself. So what we have for that I mean, it, that's pretty old, it's, it's over 2,000 years, but it's not going back into the, into the Noahic period, that sort of thing. Is there anything to the tradition about a book of Noah? 
there are books of Noah. They've been published. Again, they're, they're considered part of the Second Temple Corpus. Why? Why is everything lined up there? It's because of Qumran. It's because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it's our oldest repository for stuff. Uh, so if you find a portion of a book in there, that, that's, that's where the wall, you know, that's where you hit the wall. So Noah material, again, is, is it's going to have its own. You can, you can buy all the, the Book of Noah stuff, Books of Noah stuff, you know, in, in an anthology, in an edition. Some will, will group it in Enochian, the, the larger category of Enochian material for obvious reasons. It's the Flood and the Watchers and stuff like that. But, um, you know, you don't, you don't really gain any chronological ground, you know, with that. And it gets its name because it's about Noah. It's about the Flood. And again, it doesn't mean that, oh, somebody, like, dug this up on Ararat and then just kept it, you know. <laughs> you know it's, 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 it refers to the content. I believe the big lie that's going to be placed, hoist upon the world is that the aliens created mankind, which I categorically reject. It's funny. The people that will accept the fact that the Anunnaki star creatures came to this planet will avoid fallen angels like a plague. I wanted the correct, in my opinion, after 40 years of research, I wanted the correct historic and biblical presentation of the giants. And quite candidly, when I talk to some of them, if I start talking about fallen angels having sex with earth women, they snicker. Well, that snicker tells me they've already made up their mind. Rephaim after the flood, it just, let's just broaden it, you know, giants after the flood. It, was there a second wave of this? Uh, in, in terms of the biblical text, we were never told anything like that as, as far as, you know, another, another period or event of cohabitation. That's one of the three options for why they're there. One is you view either Noah or Noah's sons or the daughters married to those sons as somehow being a carrier, for, for lack of a better word. And, and for some ancient Jews, that was their answer, because you will find texts that, that say that. You'll find there's one text that you know, describes Noah as a giant. Again, it, it, it tells you that when you find a text like that, it tells you they're thinking about the question. And so they, they, they feel like they've got to come up with some answer to it. So Noah was like fathered by one of them, you know, those who shall not be named. You know, that. You'll find another text where Noah's parents are having an argument, you know, his dad, Lamech, this is the Genesis Apocryphon, it's a very famous text. Lamech goes to his wife, who's actually given a name in the text, Bitanosh or, or Batanosh. If it, both of them mean um, daughter of man. But he comes to her and says, well, yeah, I heard about all this Watcher stuff going on, and I just want to make sure that this kid's mine, you know. Was, <laughs> and they have an argument. She's like, don't you remember the other night when, you know. <laughs> you know so, it, again, it tells you that they're thinking about the question. So that's one option. The other option is you view the flood not as a global, a truly global event, but a, a regional event, regional or localized event. And, you know, you can, you can have that view and still say to the biblical writer, this was all the earth because all the nations of the earth are listed in Genesis 10. To us, that's regional, but to them it was comprehensive, you know, whatever. But, but you, have to, you have to somehow then have, have ancestors, Nephilim ancestors, survive the flood in some region of the known world. And, and people who take that view will usually go to um, the Aegean Sea, okay, because of the Philistines. The Philistines are actually members, we know this from Egyptian texts, the Philistines are a group of people of, from a larger group of people called the Sea Peoples, who were seafaring peoples from the Aegean. They, they come to the mainland you know, of, of not only Egypt but Canaan um, on boats. That's how they get there. Since Goliath was the son of Rapha, which you can say well, that means he's a Rephaim, and he's a Philistine, and they're one of the sea peoples, that maybe something survived here. Jeremiah talks about the, the Philistines coming from Kaftor, which is one of the Aegean you know, islands and stuff like that. And again, we, 
people know where the Philistines came from. The third option is to take Genesis 6, 1, Genesis 6, 4 and translate it a little bit differently. And this is legitimate, this is possible. If you go to Genesis 6, 4, I'll try not to have a grammar spasm here, but <clears throat> it says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Now, when there, you can take that particle and because of the verb form that follows it, okay, being an imperfect verb form, you can translate it this way. The Nephilim were on earth in those days and also afterward, whenever the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, they bore children to them. You'll actually see this verse referenced in, in Hebrew reference grammars about this particular use of the imperfect with this particle. So that's, that's possible. Now, should we do that? Is that what it really means to say? Well, who knows, because it's a translation choice. And that's all you got. You know, you, you just sort of pick one of those three, you know, answers to the question, you know, why, why we get them on the other side of the flood, and that's, you know, targeting these Rephaim. Because you, you get Rephaim in Deuteronomy 2 and 3. It's very clear. They're described as being very tall. They're referred to as Anakim. The Anakim, according to Numbers 13, come, quote, from the Nephilim. I mean, it's, it, it's point blank, you know, what, what's there. So that's, those are the paths you have to follow. You know, to, to answer that question. They're starting from the premise that all the giants are gone. We're starting from the premise that there are modern day giants now who aren't suffering from acromegaly or some pituitary disorder, but they're literally going to fulfill the biblical statement of Matthew 24 where Jesus said, just as in the days of Noah, so would it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Most people do not understand the evil most people can't even embrace the fact that this isn't about old bones. This is about a contemporary threat beyond any science fiction twisting of the facts. I don't think there's any indication that, that the, the original offenders get anywhere except where they're, I mean, they're, they're always described as being in prison. So you would, you would have to have the same sort of transgression of heaven and earth is, is what it comes down to. And there's, again, there's no indication of that specifically. I mean, you could look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 about because of the angels, and you could say, well, Paul apparently thought this was a possibility. Okay, you could say that, but Paul's not making a statement that it did. It's just, he would, he's like, we just don't ever want to see this happen again. You know, it, it, it's that kind of thing. So you could take that and say, well, for Paul, maybe it was a possibility, but... It, it's, not a, it's not a real answer to the question. Because of the bias of the Smithsonian and their contempt for out of place artifacts, every time giants were found, it didn't matter if it was on the West Coast, the Arctic, the Antarctic, believe it or not, the East Coast, the Ohio River mounds, they always have a fabulous cutoff point, meaning once the Smithsonian is notified, and those bones are sent to the Smithsonian, they're never heard from again. And there's denials. A good example of that, it was a famous Kincaid expedition to the Grand Canyon, where they found the Egyptian citadel. Even the Phoenix Gazette carried that story. So Cover-up has always been to keep this biblically relevant topic out of the minds of the people, so at an appropriate time in the future, they can claim whatever they want to claim, and they'll claim anything and everything apart from the true biblical origin of giants. When do I think Genesis 1 to 11 was written? Because of the, the heavy Mesopotamian influence there um, in those 11 chapters. And could, could Moses have had that information? That's a short way of saying it. Um, well, I would never want to say that Moses couldn't have had the information. Moses is an Egyptian. He's raised in the court of Pharaoh, Akkadian during the New Kingdom, which is, would be the Mosaic era by either chronology, either, either later or, uh, or, or uh, older chronology. Um, Akkadian in that period, which was the, the literary language of Babylonian stuff, Mesopotamian stuff, was kind of like English is today. It was the lingua franca. It was the language of, of international correspondence. And we know that for sure 
because of the Tel El Amarna letters. Okay, these are letters, it's a correspondence, I'm sure you've heard of the El Amarna letters. They're actually a correspondence between the Pharaoh of Egypt and his underlings in Canaan, the people he's put in charge. And it, they're written in Akkadian, they're not written in Egyptian. So we, we know that, that for sure. So if Moses, again, was being groomed to be a Pharaoh or a diplomat or some other high high office in the household of Pharaoh, I think it's reasonable to assume he, was pro he probably had to learn Akkadian. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Um, again, it, it's still an argument from silence because we don't actually know what he read. The, the question then becomes, okay, if he could read it, what is he reading? There's no evidence in Egypt that you have libraries from Mesopotamia in Egypt. You have lots of correspondence. You got lots of letters and documents and land deeds. And wouldn't that have been awful, you know, to spend your youth, you know, deciphering economic texts? You know, like somebody's bill to somebody for ten sheep. You know, <laughs> you know, you, you, treaties. I guess would be better. You know, you got to learn that stuff. But so we don't really know again what he would have you know, been reading. Um, on the other side, there's so much that, that is, is overtly polemic in Genesis 1 to 11 against Mesopotamian material that it's really next to impossible. In fact, it, it, it would just violate what you actually see in the text to say that whoever wrote Genesis 1 through 11, or at least this part of Genesis 1 through 11, was not looking at a Mesopotamian text specifically to respond to things in that text. Because you'll, it's, and it's more than like deity names and stuff like that. It, it's even grammar in some places where they, they want the literate person to know what they are tracking on and what they're objecting to. How they are subverting the Mesopotamian material that they assume the reader knows. It gets very detailed. So you, there are places you just have to have that in front of you, unless I guess you, you memorized cuneiform or something. I mean, again, that, that's possible. There were people who, who did that. So it, it's a back and forth you know, for me. I, I think the more reasonable expl explanation is that Genesis 1 through 11 or what was either composed or edited during the exile with this strategy in mind. But I won't say that it's impossible that Moses you know, could have known that and, and had access to the material. We just, we don't, we don't see a path, but that doesn't mean there wasn't one. Why do people who have the evidence, why are they intimidated? Why are they threatened? Why are they disappeared? What is this cover up? And I'll tell you the bottom line, they do not want people to understand that the sons of God, the fallen angels, saw that the daughters of earth were fair mated with them and produce a literally new race of hybrid beings that the Bible calls the Rephaim. And the Rephaim are with us today, their genetic trace, their genetic markers, the super soldiers, the most uh, important expenditures made are to identify not only the bloodline, but the genetic traits. There are people literally not only wanting to bring the giants back, but to insert giant genes in our soldiers to give them the super soldier ability. More money is being spent to identify genetic traces and markers, the actual gene prints of giants, both dead and extractable DNA from their teeth, from whatever cells in the mummies, to literally living giants today. The idea that spirit beings can take on flesh and do things that flesh does is is a very biblical idea. God himself, even before the incarnation, takes on bodily form. Genesis 18 is the classic example uh, where God, you know, Yahweh, shows up with two men who we find out in Genesis 19 are actually angels. They're called angels in Genesis 19. So the three of them come and visit Abraham. They look like men. They're embodied. They sit down. They have a meal. They eat together. I mean, it, it says all these things. Um, you know, the, the, two of, the two angels, of course, grab Lot and pull him into the house. And, you, know, you, you have instances where divine beings become corporeal and they are truly corporeal. You know, it's not incarnation. The, I want to be careful there. Theologians would use words like embodiment for that. But the assumption is that, okay, they don't have to eat, but they can. Spirit beings don't have to do anything that a body does. But when they inhabit a body, 
it, it, it's a body. It, it does what bodies do. Um, you know, you, the, the, the whole you know, trajectory seems to indicate, and, and this, this is pretty consistent when you get angel talk uh, in, in scripture. And in, in the book, I, I spent a lot on the, spent three chapters <clears throat> talking about the two Yahweh figures in the Old Testament. The visible Yahweh appears to Israelites as a man. And that doesn't mean the invisible Yahweh is, is there and not anywhere else. There's still God, you know, both in heaven and on earth. On earth, he's this, this human you know, being. God as man is not a New Testament invention. It comes from the Old Testament. And it's, it's part of where, it's part of what becomes Trinitarian thinking. And I, I'm a standard Trinitarian. But you, you know, you, you get the, the impression that when a divine being comes to earth, especially if it's not God or not the Father, that the required form of dress is flesh. Uh, there, are, there are very few, in fact, it, it would be hard for me to come up with one where an angel speaks to anybody in the Bible and they're not in human form. I mean, I know God does that. I, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't really think of an angel ever doing that. You, you have to be able, the person has to be able to process who's in their presence and what, you know, what they're talking with. Um, so God even does that at some times. So in, in terms of the precedent for it, it's there. Now you say, well, why, why include you know, the notion of copulation? In the book, this is why I, I wanted to make clear to people that there are two views of Genesis 6 that, that are supernatural in orientation. One is sexual cohabitation. The other one takes the language in Genesis 6 as euphemistic for other gods, other sons of God, other divine beings, as intentionally raising up human populations who in the biblical story ultimately turn out to be the peoples that are trying to exterminate the Israelites when they get into the land. You say, well, how would that work? It would, it, it's the Abraham and Sarah analogy. It's very clear that God did something to enable Abraham and Sarah to have children. There is no hint of any sexual contact between God and Sarah. But the text is equally clear that they were supernaturally enabled to have children when they were well beyond their, the age of doing so. So the assumption in, in view number two is that divine beings can do something you know, with people to enable them to have children. And so maybe that's what Genesis 6 is talking about, minus the sexual language. And I go back to the, to the first part of the question. I take the supernatural view because I don't want to disagree with Peter and Jude because they're inspired and I'm not. Uh, Peter and Jude very plainly, explicitly, I, I, I frankly, I mean, I, and I know that the, and I'll, I'll be as bold to say, I know the sophistry involved to try to get them to say something they're not saying. I know how that's done because I'm a scholar and scholars do that sort of thing. They refer to the angels that sinned, okay, in 2 Peter and Jude. These angels are in prison until the time of the end. There is no angelic sin, in the, not only in the Old Testament, but in the entirety of the Bible. There is no plural angelic sin anywhere except for Genesis 6. So you either have to say Peter and Jude are making one up, or they're thinking about Genesis 6. It's the only place you can go. And since they throw in the detail about the imprisonment, which you won't find in the Old Testament directly, you'll, you'll, you'll get it obliquely in underworld passages that have, guess who, the Rephaim in them. You'll get it there obliquely. But the only place that does say that directly is the Enochian material, which again is tracking on both the Mesopotamian story and Genesis 6. And ultimately, the Mesopotamian story is what Genesis 6 is written to respond to. So essentially, you're trapped. If you want to get your theology from the text, you either have to affirm the supernatural nature of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, or you say Peter and Jude got it wrong. That's your choice. This is going to cause a controversy because Frankly, people don't want to hear that. Christians don't want to hear that. Christians, this is why I say they, they we, we, and it's not anything bad about people. And I, it's just that we're taught 
to be selectively supernatural. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we accept God, we accept Trinity, we accept Satan, because you know, we got to have that, or else why even have a discussion about Christianity? But then why exclude this other stuff? I'll tell you why, because it's just stinking weird. Okay, that, that's, that's why we're excluding it. And Peter and Jude didn't do that. Irenaeus didn't do that. Lots of other, you know, f famous figures that you could go to in church history didn't do that. I, I don't use guys from church history as an argument, not because I, I view them as, as foes, but they're not, they're not from the actual context. You know, they're, they're later. I mean, I, I think they're, they're doing the best they can with what they have. But, you know, yeah, I'm well aware that that's, you know, controversial. I don't really care what view it takes. As far as the metaphysics of it, like how does that work, I don't know because I'm not a god. I'm not a deity. I'm me, okay? I'm, <laughs> I can't tell you, you know, I, 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 I kind of use the phrase a lot. I try not to put the words God and can't into too many sentences. I also try not to, not to tell, not, not, not to sound like I know what a divine being can or cannot do. I have no idea, okay, because biblical theology, I think, requires us to affirm the reality of a supernatural world where such beings exist. I got to go with that and then wonder about, well, what is it like to be one of them? Like, like what, what can they actually do? What are their limitations? I don't know the answers to any of those questions. Cerebral capabilities, the giants, even when they're in a stasis state, that means in suspended animation, whether it's Dr. Ernest Muldashev in Russia, uh, in the mountains of Tibet, whether it's a whole underground base in which some of these entities, these living giants are present, they have so much cerebral energy that they, they actually have what's called the red line. And you can't go past that, or literally, they claim according to special operations, four-star generals, that literally it, it causes a person to almost come apart at the seams. It not only drives people mad, but it literally just causes them to go to pieces. You understand that's the ultimate weapon. You know, Michael Crichton with Jurassic Park brought us dinosaurs and now we're hearing about woolly mammoths being cloned and, and we're hearing all these news stories that Neanderthal is no longer uh, a member of our family tree, which I've said for 30 years, but the point being is that it's all about weapons. And as a general said to me in special operations, it doesn't matter if it's ancient technology, it doesn't matter if it's ancient genetics, those of us are either fighting to keep it out of the hands of the wrong people, or the wrong people are fighting us to kill us to get it into their hands. There's a war going on, and it's no longer just dusty old bones in a museum stuck away. About the line, blameless in his generations. Okay, the word here is door. Door is the term you would use of generation in terms of like your, your timeline or your epoch. Like if we, if we talk about the generation of the 60s, okay, that's not referring to lineal genealogical descent, it's referring to sort of a time period. Door is the typical word for that, not lineal descent. Lineal descent is typically toledot. These are the generations of, and then you get the grocery list. Okay. Um, there, there are exceptions. Though. There, there are one or two places where door, um, right here, Numbers 18, 23, but the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetuate statute throughout your generations. Now, if he's speaking to the Levites there, he's referring to the Levites and their descendants. This is their job. Okay, you know, that, that sort of thing. So there it could refer to lineal descent. Um, down here, until all the generation. That could either be time period or, or again, people's bloodlines. I mean, there, there are one or two that, that could sort of go either way. Generations, plural, again, referring to the, to the people themselves, not just the a specific time period. There are a handful of references where door could refer to lineal descent. And so going back to Genesis 6-9, if I were the writer of this text and I wanted you, the reader, to think of lineal descent, I would not use door because you might be misled. I would use toledot. But, but, if I did use door, and that's what we have here, there's still a possibility I could have been thinking that. So you can't eliminate it, you can just make it a question of probability. 
it most likely does not refer to that. One of the most remarkable things from my four-star general friend was basically said they hunt by DNA. Every person's DNA has a specific harmonic that they could identify a specific uh, target's DNA and assign a Fido, the 19-foot uh, giant, to go after. And, and it was interesting because when you think about it, even going back to Jack the Giant Killer and Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick, as I've been researching all these, remember the statement? Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. You go to the Bible and whose blood cried out? Righteous Abel blood cried out to the living God after Cain slew him. So the harmonics of blood is fascinating. That's why the cry of the innocent blood is such a, a, a big deal in God's eyes and it truly is because the blood has a signal, a frequency. And there have been studies to prove that. So they want the giants to be able to basically target specific DNA characteristics. Not to mention the bottom line, and you know how much I love to say that, these entities want every last human being destroyed and in its place a hybrid. They're going to try and prove that God's a liar. Jesus himself said if the days weren't shortened, there'd be no flesh left alive. Yet for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The day of the Lord is, again, the time of the end where all the enemies of God get punished and all the righteous, you know, they, they turn out to be you know, rewarded in, either in this life or the next and so on and so forth. Everything wrong is made right, everything right, you know, you know stands you know, for what it is. So we tend to think of that in terms of the way we're taught about Armageddon this big battle, you know, on, on the earth. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But there are passages like Isaiah 34, okay, Isaiah 24, that refer to this final conflict as involving angels, divine beings, okay, the stars of heaven, you know, the, this, the holy ones, okay, come with the Lord, you know, down to earth to punish the, not only the host on earth, but the host of heaven in heaven. And it's a reference to the fact that when God cleans house, this isn't the only house that gets cleaned. In other words, the earthly sphere is going to be judged, but also the spiritual world is going to get the same treatment. And so for that reason, you have angels often referenced with this time of the end kind of stuff because they have a specific role to play. And it's, it's judgment. Genesis 6, Sodom and Gomorrah, that sort of thing. But anything more specific, you know, going back to the, the, the first four verses of Genesis 6, I haven't come across anything there yet. This cover-up has been a multi-thousand year cover-up and what the expectation that everyone is going to, uh, not only the expectation, but what is going to be presented to the people as the gods who made us. And I got to share this, when I did write the book True Legends, Genesis 6 Giants, Aliens and Fallen Angels, Angel Wars, everything I've written is to this point where Jesus said, if the days weren't shortened for the elect's sake, there'd be no flesh left alive. And the genetic tampering, the genetic destruction, the designs of the Luciferian globalists to destroy every human being on the planet to insert their new creation, that we'll call him uh, the Uberman, uh, Nietzsche's statement, the Superman, what it's going to be is a super slaughter. And by giving people the correct information, by literally telling them what the end of the book is, how this plays out in history, my goal is to take away all fear and show them that the truth will make them free as long as they abide in the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord abides in them. Too many people are making too many excuses for the living God and I'm looking for that time when the people of God will stand up, when the people of God will not take a back seat to the skeptic who's the only agenda he has is what he's being paid to say. Okay, demonic activity that we might see now or again referenced in the Gospels and the sons of God and the watchers, I mean what What's up with that? You know, who are, is this one group or many? It, it, you, you have different groups because you have different rebellions. Okay, we have Genesis 3, you got one entity, you have a divine rebellion, the, the figure we know as Satan, and so on and so forth. Genesis 6, you got a, a, you know, a bunch. Okay, we're never, you know, Old Testament doesn't give us a number, other texts, you know, throw numbers around. 
but you have a you have a, a divine rebellion there, which is punished by you know we're sending you to the abyss. Okay. Then you have a third rebellion, and that is what happens at Babel. Okay, where God punishes the nations, he assigns them to sons of God, other sons of God, other lesser Elohim, uh, lesser divine beings than himself, as a punishment. So that's a, that's a totally different group. Now, that group is the one that, you know, is the orienting point for what scholars call cosmic geography, you know, different episodes in the Old Testament where things happen that the la language is used that a typical deity is associated with a typical place, okay? Uh, Paul is, is referencing this when he refers to principalities and powers. Uh, Paul uses terms that show up in Daniel 10, the princes, the prince of Persia, prince of Greece, all that kind of talk, you know, d divine beings that are over the nations and manipulating them and, and abusing them. Paul's other vocabulary, thrones, dominions, powers, rulers, authorities, they are all terms used of geographical rulership. That is not a coincidence. Paul understands the world of the Gentile perceived through the eyes of God, that these nations are under the dominion of divine beings that he assigned to those nations, but who rebelled, that's what Psalm 82 is about, and are now hostile to him. So we have spiritual warfare in, in, in the most explicit sense in all this. But they're a third group. So there's, there's no sense that that group has been dealt with or punished or put in the abyss. So they're, for lack of a better way of putting it, they're running around, they're doing their thing. They're abusing the nations, they're abusing the people, you know, they get the people to, you know, do all sorts of things in self-destructive patterns. And again, it, it's back to Psalm 82. So they're going to they're gonna be judged, again, at the time of the end, which means they can still be active in some sense now. Now, I personally don't, don't assign specific points of geography to them anymore. And that's because the Old Testament story, once you get post-cross, it's no longer about just this entity, you know, Israel, and, and 70 nations in Genesis 10, it becomes about all the world okay, now, now needs to be won back. It's not, Jesus is not just the Messiah for Israel, he is the Messiah to the nations. Paul is the apostle to the nations, to the Gentiles. It becomes global on both sides. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. This is written to Gentiles in Galatians 3. Okay. The people of God are not just Israelites. It not, has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with land boundaries. Okay? The people of God are those Jew or Gentile who align themselves with Christ, and where they are is where he is. Okay? Where two or three of you are gathered, and there I am in your midst. Just this whole theology that cosmic geography now is wherever Christians are, that should be considered holy ground and treated as such and taken you know, as, as holy ground, to use the metaphor. Wherever, the, wherever the, the Spirit of God is not present, because the Spirit of God indwells believers, this is why believers are called collectively and individually the temple. Okay, again, the language is not accidental. This is where the glory is. Okay, wherever it's not, wherever believers are not, that is ground under dominion of somebody else. And so that's that's the sense. We, we need to view it in a, in a sort of a collective sense. So in that regard, that whole system created through the, the events of the Old Testament is still around and still active. But those guys, again, in, in biblical thinking and in Second Temple Jewish thinking, those are not the demons that Jesus encounters in the Gospels. Those, that's something else. Those are specifically, we, we saw one passage in Enoch. The demons in the Gospel stories are the, the disembodied, immaterial part of the dead Nephilim, the dead giant clans. This is why you get Rephaim in the underworld in the Old Testament to create that linkage. You know, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 32, you know, Job 26, you, know, you, you see them there. And that thinking went all the way you know, in between the Testaments where you have lots of, of texts talking about this is what demons are. This is why demons are called at Qumran, bastard spirits. They're bastards because they're mixed. They come from this event back here. This is why the terminology is used. 
and to telegraph this. But we're not taught this in church. We're not taught demonology in church, I guess, for a good reason. But, you know, you know, th th this is this is standard Jewish demonology. Is I'm not. I don't really have to look too hard to find it uh, in the text. But all that group and again this this national stuff, this cosmic geographical stuff. Those are the two groups that the that Jesus and the apostles have to deal with. So you know you, you can look at what goes on in the world today, and, and I, I trust missionaries that that I mean I've I've. I've given divine, divine counsel lectures to, to like groups of African pastors and they can barely stay awake, you know, because it's like, yeah, we deal with this all the time. You know, this is like, no kidding, you know, it, and, and they get it because they, they run into it. Um, there's a very, uh, I, don't, I won't want to call it famous, but if you're interested from a, sort of a more tame uh, Christian context, we'll, we'll pick on the Lutherans here. There's a book called I Am Not Afraid. It's by a Lutheran guy, and you can't get any more unexcited than Lutherans, okay? <laughs> these, these aren't charismatics, okay? So it was this, it's a it, it's, guy was on, had to write a dissertation, and his dissertation topic was like church planting in Africa. So he went to some group that his church and his denomination was helping in Africa. And when he got over there, part of their liturgy, everywhere they went, and their order of service was exorcisms. They would just go into a town and oh, we're going to have a church service, we're going to start a church here and, and they, they didn't have to solicit anything. People would show up and before they did anything it's like okay we need to we need to claim this as holy ground because of the principalities and powers and they do whatever their service and people would just people would go crazy. It, it would sort of bring out the possession instead of bring out your dead, it's bring out your possessed, you know. <laughs> and and they just they just like went through the this is what we do, and this guy was like shocked. He's like they never taught us this in seminary. <laughs> Did Luther write about this, you know? And so he wound up changing his topic to talk to write about that because it just he couldn't believe it. He'd never seen anything like it. And to the to the people over there, they're still Lutherans. They're still boring. Okay, they're still not charismatic, but they're like, yep, yeah, it's just what we need to do here. So we do it, because if we didn't do it, we wouldn't get anywhere. Okay. Get her done. <laughs> get her done. <laughs> so, it, you know, I, 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 trust, I trust people who have no reason to lie to me, and they have no reason to just lie in general. Missionaries from all over the world, yep, yeah, we went into that town, and there was just this place that we were told, this is owned, this is under dominion. And you get a confrontation there, something goes on there, I mean, there, there's something that, that is going on there. So I think that stuff does happen and can happen. It's a reflection of, again, the, the whole cosmic geographical thing. Um, so it, it's either that or it's, again, some low-level, you know, demonic entity. Because, the, the, again, if you know the terminology, sons of God, the geographical dominion guys are at a high, they're higher on the pecking order in both biblical and standard Jewish demonology. Even as everything is lining up, we are in the days of Noah. In the Noah days, there were giants in the land. And now we're having Hollywood just come out with movie after movie after movie, trying to denigrate biblical uh, Moses, it doesn't matter if it's Noah, trying to distort true history so they can insert their own history. For instance, in the movie Noah, this is pretty fascinating, most people don't know this, the fallen angels are the good guys and Noah's the bad guy. They're called the Watchers. The Messiah was about undoing all of it. The, the, the cross is about a solution for the problem of death. That was the result of what happens in Genesis 3. Estrangement from God, we are, we are separated, estranged from the source of life. You cannot have eternal life unless you're in the presence of God, okay? So it's about a solution for that. It's about a solution for the general proliferation of depravity in the world, which again, Second Temple Jews are going to lay squarely at the feet of the whole Genesis 6 thing. It's also about reversing what happened at Babel, taking the nations back, making the Gentiles part of the people of God again. And all of it, the, the, the Messiah is critical to all of that.
But well, amen, when it comes down to it, it's all about Yeshua and that ultimate atonement on the cross. But I'd be interested in what you got to say about the subject of rebellious angels and half-breed giant. What do you think about the subject? You think when Yeshua came here, he took back all that, set that to right? Or do you think those rebellious angels are still trying to plot and plan while the clock ticks down for them. And there might be a possibility of giants living among us today. Let me know in those comments down below. And while you're heading down that way, if you're not already, why not hit that little subscribe button down there. Make sure you give us a little love with that thumbs up. And while you're at it, why not share this here little video with any friends or family members that you think might benefit from or enjoy watching this here little video. Big shout out to Gabe. Good seeing you today, brother. As always, hope you have a safe night at work tonight. When you get a chance, I hope you get to watch this here little video. And a big shout out and thank you to every one of you sitting here watching this right now. I know your time is valuable and I surely do appreciate you spending a little bit here with us, delving into the more unusual parts of our Bible. Hope to see you here next time. And until next time, remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. And so do I. Now get off of here, go ride your bike, and read your Bible.